Good morning, everybody. My name's Chad, one of the pastors here. I want to pray for us as we get started. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. I thank you that you have no rival. You have no equal. Not all of us believe that yet. Um, God, actually, most of us in this room would say that probably something this past week rivaled our affection for you or became something that we chose that we thought was better. And so, Lord, what that lets me know is, God, we need you. We need you to change us. We need you to go after our hearts and to pursue us this morning. And so, would you do that, Jesus? We love you. We bless you. In Christ's name, amen. amen. I do want to welcome you. I want to welcome the uh, high school and middle school students across the hall. What's up, peeps? <laughs> there they are. Um, so good to be together. If you're watching online, we are starting a brand new series, which I'm pumped about, the Gospel of John. Yeah, and one of the reasons is because this guy was on the scene. He was there. And he tells you later in the book, John chapter 20, why he wrote. It's not at the beginning, hey, I'm writing because of this. He says later in John 20, these things... All these stories, all of these things I've told you about, I've written them, and here it is, so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, which means Messiah, King, that he's the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And I dare you, over the next however many months it takes us to go through John, to open your Bible during the week and let him speak to you. Sit in that chair. If you're wondering what chair time is, you keep hearing people say about it, you can watch on there, but the basics are you sit in a chair, you open this book. There's so many apps out there that'll give you reading plans, different things, devotionals. You sit down, you calm your heart and your mind, morning, afternoon, night, lunch break, in the car, on the way to work, and you say, Jesus, I'm here. Would you speak to me through your word? I dare you to dive into this book because what has happened to people throughout the centuries who have done that is they've given their lives for him. They've committed their whole existence to Jesus. So that picture of Peter and John running to the tomb. And why are they running? Because they're saying, no way, no way could it be true. And I want you to say the same thing. I want that image to be in your mind. Could it be true that he really is the son of God, that he really is who he said he was? You know, John had friends too. Sometimes we read about these guys and we think they're, you know, first of all, pictures from the middle ages and the paintings that have been done of the apostles. They're kind of scary. You look at them and they're like, you know, they have these faces and you're like, that's a scary dude. I don't know if I want to be like him. He's a real guy. He was a real guy and he had friends. And one of his friends' names was Polycarp. And this guy ended up being a leader in the New Testament church. Polycarp was so convinced that Jesus was the son of God that when Roman soldiers came to arrest him, even though his friends were saying, dude, get out of here, run, hide. He stayed in the house and he said, it's okay. God's already told me that I'm going to die for this. What? He's already told me I'm going to die for this. And so the Roman soldiers come in and they're ready to take him captive. And he says, you guys look hungry. Can we make you some food? Polycarp historically had somebody make a plate full of food, a dinner table had the Roman, imagine him, he's sitting at the table, you know, kind of like this. Here's the Roman soldiers eating in front of him. After they finish, what are they going to do? Take him to his trial? for following Jesus. And he's like, is it good? You feel, you feel satisfied? And they're like, yeah, we're, we're good. Okay, let's go. They take him. He eventually would be burned to death. History tells us that people said it didn't smell like human flesh. Who knows? Fox's Book of Martyrs says that it smelled like bread baking. And that Polycarp stood there with confidence and they were going to tie him to the post. He said, there's no need. I'll stand here. God will give me 
the grace and the courage to stand. And I listen to a story like that, and I say, whoa, I live in Winona. <laughs> and nobody's burning anybody today. But so what's it, what does it mean to lean in like this? Where you have somebody like John in, in his other letters writing to churches. You know what he said? He said, hey, I touched him. I looked into his eyes. I know what the color they were. I know what his voice sounded like. It wasn't a New York accent. He's from the Middle East. And because, you know, you wonder that. Did he have a high voice? Did he have a medium voice? Did he have a low voice? We always think, like, if it's God, he must have had a low voice. <laughs> who knows? Maybe he was totally high-pitched and, and kind of had a raspy Who knows? But John wants to tell you, I was there. I saw him. I touched him. I watched Thomas touch his hands. And actually later, I got to as well. In the flesh, I saw him. So one question for you, as you think about this guy who stood there on the beach and heard Jesus call his name to follow him, who watched him do miracles, who sat at the table with Judas on the other side as Jesus was about to give his life, who stood at a distance because he was afraid just like everybody else, and he ran watching Jesus be whipped and his flesh be torn from his body, who stood at the cross with his mother Mary, watching him give his very last breath who ran with excitement. And actually we know from scripture that he was faster than Peter because Peter, he outran Peter. Like they're both running to the tomb and it's like, <laughs> Peter, I just, I love thinking about this. I imagine Peter going, come on, John, stop it. Running past him, goes into the tomb, sees the empty tomb. We also know that when this was written, 60 years later, he was still following he had been arrested. He had seen his own friends give their life for Jesus. Did that cause him to go, I don't know if I want to do this? Nope. He's still there. So here's my question for you. If this guy really saw all these things, if he was on the scene, don't you want to spend a little time with him? Wouldn't you like to sit down with him and say, tell me? That's what he's telling you. This is why I've written this, and I would humbly submit to us this morning that spending time in the gospel of John for months to come is time well spent. You will hear the voice of God if you lean in and ask him to speak to you because he wrote so that you would believe that he's the son of God and that you would have life in his name. So in the Bibles we've provided underneath the chairs or on the screen or on your phone, page 886, John chapter one, we'll start with five verses. One of the things you're gonna notice right away is John is not like the other guys with the gospels. Matthew was like, here's a big list of names, which we all know what to do when we read a big list of names in the Bible. We're like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, it's hard to read. And the other's like, here's the story of Jesus and how he was born. John starts this way, in the beginning. Does that remind you of a book? Hmm, yep, Genesis. He wants you to be thinking about Genesis right away. He wants to connect you right there. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Are you kidding me? Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and it actually, the, the word there means continues to shine in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it, or in other words, cannot put it out as much as there is a lot of effort to put it out. The light continues to shine. In the beginning, John is not only wanting to take you back to the first book of the Bible, He's wanting to say further, further back. He wants you to think, he wants you to feel deeply, and he wants you to ask this question. What was God thinking before there was thinking? For anything existed, what was he thinking? You know, we connect words. When people speak, we can figure out a little bit of what's going on in here, can't we? To their thoughts. And our words express who we are. Words reveal the heart behind a person. And even when we try to hide behind our words, we're pretty good at discerning, aren't we? We know, we can kind of tell, we get a good judge of character. So in God's words, in the word of God himself, Jesus, we find out exactly 
what God is thinking. And John wants you to know that. Here is what God thinks and feels, and it is specifically spoken through Jesus Christ. He is the word of God. Now, the word is kind of a weird one, logos, which is where we get our word logic. And back then, Greek thinking people thought logic and wisdom is the ultimate thing to acquire. Gnosticism, we've talked about that a little bit in our series on Hebrews. People felt like there's this secret knowledge you could acquire. They didn't think about God when they thought about the beginning of the earth. They thought about wisdom. Wisdom was out there. And John wants to say, he is wisdom. He is past wisdom. He is beyond it. But then he says this, and I want you to think about this. He made everything that has been made. Everything you see in front of you, there's not one thing that he hasn't made. And when we know about the Old Testament, when God speaks, what happens? Worlds are born. Stars suddenly, whoosh, billions and billions. I know some of you maybe have seen some of those. Louis Giglio uh, is a pastor in Atlanta, the, the Passion Church, um, talking about how long it would take for us to count just the stars in our Milky Way galaxy. Y yeah, you would finish your whole life. If you counted one per second, you still wouldn't reach for the rest of your life. Okay? So, Another 50, 60 years, you're counting one star per second, you would still be counting. That's just our galaxy. And God speaks and says, all of them. Oh, and by the way, I know every single name too. The cedars of Lebanon, the Psalms tell us that when God speaks, these massive trees, which we don't know Lebanon, we've not been there, but how many have seen the trees in California, the redwood trees, or the pictures of them? Yeah, totally. Cars driving through them, these massive trees. What the psalmist is trying to say is when God speaks, trees like that burst into millions of splinters instantly. That's what he does. That's how he accomplishes things. When we're going to read about a verse in a few weeks, one that everybody has probably heard at some point in their life, or if you've watched an NFL game on TV, you've seen the guy with the sign, John 3, 16. Incidentally, that guy divorced his wife. I know, like I read about this, like here's the one thing we all knew about, like there's, oh great, kind of that weird nod to culture. That's public faith. Not really. But here's the guy with the poster, John 3, 16, and then I read about him and he's not even walking with God. But when it says, for God so loved the world, it isn't God just having nice feelings. Ah, he loves us, which he does. It's action. It is him saying, I am going to accomplish something through my words. When you think about God's word, you are <coughs> hearing what he thinks what he feels, really, truly able to know him. Now, you can know about someone, but you really don't know them until you talk to them. Years ago, I saw Danny Glover in an airport, and Lisa was with me, and I, I followed him into the bathroom. <laughs> I was like totally acting like I was supposed to be there and like washing my hands, wait until he walks out, and then he walks out, and I'm like, hey, are you Danny Glover? <laughs> totally doing the stupid celebrity thing. I love your movies. That's all I had. I don't know him. I don't know him. You have to talk to somebody to know them. You have to sit with them for a long time. I know Lisa. I know my children. I know friends because I know their words. I connect their words to their heart and their feelings. And what John wants you to know is that when you see Jesus to know God fully, to truly know him, you have to go through his words and the very word of God. Now, when John wrote this book, there was a movement of heresy underway. And there's a guy named Serenthus. Don't anybody name their kid Serenthus, if you were thinking about it. Um, Serenthus was a popular guy. And the thing he was teaching was that Jesus was a good man. You can probably finish it, right? But He's not the son of God. If you go to Jerusalem today, I mentioned this a while back in our Hebrews thing, but it's worth repeating the dome of the rock inside written is there is only one God and he does not have a son. It's right there in the middle of the place where it all began. 
Serenthus was teaching this, and there's a story that Polycarp, the guy who gave his life, who was a friend of John, tells of John being in a bathhouse. Weird, they did this back then, but they would all like hang out in the bathhouse. Um, and Serenthus was in there. And John recognized Serenthus, and history tells us that John ran out potentially naked into the street and was yelling at the top of his lungs, Serenthus is in there, he's a heretic, and I bet the building is going to come down on him. So I don't want to be in there when the building comes down. That's how much zeal he had for believing that Jesus was the Son of God. And so this was the current thought, and so you know what he said? I'm going to write an account, and I'm going to start with him being divine and before everything as the word of God. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. You don't see it right away, but he is referencing two of the most important events in history. The light shining in the darkness, I want you to immediately think about Jesus on a hillside, poised on the edge of humanity and history as a light, a single light, the only true light And Satan is attempting to put him out, thinking that he is accomplishing it. And basically, John is right away telling you, not only is he God and he's the word of God and he's been here before time, he has not been able to be overcome. He has not won. Satan will not win. The resurrection of Jesus is true right from the beginning. So he introduces us to somebody in the next few verses. Let's look at verse six. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is not the John who's writing. This is John the Baptist. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Now, next week, we're gonna really get into John the Baptist and we're gonna have Joe the Baptist doing most of our baptisms, uh, all of them actually. If you're thinking about being baptized, please consider it. It'd be an awesome thing. Um, But he wants to at least introduce you a second to say, hey, here's this guy. I want you to know about him. And I think there's something as I was reading this week, a question that is in the fine print of every heart, every human being alive. And it's this. What did you make me for, Jesus? Why, why, Why am I here? So this picture, I like it. Um, And if you go online, there's a couple of cool photography websites, you'll see thousands of pictures of, and usually younger millennial generation people, and they're gorgeous pictures. And they're, it's usually them, and they're standing like this, looking into the distance, looking out of the ocean, looking at a mountain. And I want to encourage you, especially those of you who are older, and we didn't grow up in the social media generation, we're kind of catching up. Uh, it's easy to maybe be critical and to be like, oh, the selfie generation, just blah, blah, blah. It was, it was really cool this week because God, I think, gave me his heart, which is this. Every person who stands and does that is looking and asking, Lord, what is my purpose? Why am I here? caught up in the beauty of creation and looking into sunsets and mountains. Why did you make me? And John the Baptist is a great, just tiny picture of why you're here. God's plan for making himself known was to send somebody who wasn't normal to be nice. John the Baptist was a wonky, wild guy. Ate bugs, dressed in weird clothes, was out in the desert, yelling and screaming, calling out people. And I think what you're going to find, and here's the thing too, God takes the ordinary of no consequence people and he chooses them to be the ones who will tell the greatest story in the world. He doesn't pick a politician. He doesn't pick a king. He picks ordinary people to which I say, sweet, I'm ordinary, Lord. can, Can you use me? I'm ordinary. John was not your normal person. God picked this unusual man in an unusual setting outside of the commonly accepted religion and said, here's the one that is gonna be my voice. An unlikely team to tell the most important story in the world is gonna be a consistent theme throughout scripture. Acts 4.13 is a great example. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, this is later, they're building the church, and perceived this, that they were uneducated, 
common men. So they're looking at Peter and John, and they're like, those guys didn't have school. Fishermen, riffraff, common. It says they were astonished. Why? Not because of their resume, not because of their pedigree, anything, their family lineage, because they had been with Jesus. It's the only thing you need. That's the only thing he asks. And John was that kind of guy from the beginning. We know from scripture that he leapt in the womb when he got near to, to Jesus, who was also in Mary's womb. And it was like this kind of, he responded to the presence of God right away. But he also wasn't perfect. He was in prison later in his life. And he was asking, Jesus, are you really who you say you are? Are you really the one? He came to bear witness. That word is a Greek word, martus, which is where we get the word martyr. So when you read he came to bear witness, it's pretty much saying he came to live and give his life for Christ. What are you made for? What am I made for? John knew who he belonged to, who made him, why he was made, and his life is a beacon to you and me that ours is to be the same. Augustine said this, O oh God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. You will be restless until you find rest in Christ. And John is just a tiny little sliver of an example of someone, why were you made? <coughs> to give glory to him, to speak for him. And if you're common and ordinary like me, God says, that's perfect. That's what I need. That's what I will work with. And look at what John says next in verse nine. The true light, which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. The world was made through him, yet the world didn't know him. He came to his own. His own people did not receive him. But whenever you see that word in scripture, it's a wonderful word. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, just basically meaning it's not going to be normal birth. It's going to be spiritual of God nor the will of man, but of God. So what is he saying about creation and how we responded? This, no one wants him. Nobody, including you. Nobody wants him. And it's absurd that the creatures would reject the creator, but that's exactly what happened. And that's how we're born. So think about this. The very ability to live, breathe, eat, sleep, laugh has all cap happened because we were lovingly brought into the world, not by chance, but on purpose. And our very lives today depend on the creator's word having spoken to create water, oxygen, wheat, vegetables. But when the source himself shows up, even though they were made through him, sustained by him, as Hebrews tells us, they said, we don't want you. I don't know you. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world didn't know him. If you went down to a molecular level in your body, to the DNA, and if there is such a thing, which I believe there is, the spiritual DNA of who you are, who God made you to be, you would find, if you could get down small enough, something written there. You know what it says? Made by J.C. His. He made it. And we, in our core, will say, we don't want you, though. Even those who should have known. The question is, why do we prefer darkness? Aren't sins just bad choices? Don't we just, is just making bad choices? Isn't that why we don't want him? You know, he uses the word world here four times. He was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. And he's not meeting the environment. Actually, I actually heard that years ago. If God so loved the world, gave his only begotten son. That's why we need to recycle. <laughs> I promise there's a, there are books about it. And I think God wants us to be good stewards. Absolutely. Recycle. 
But that's not what he's talking about. When, he's, when John uses the word world, here's what he means. Creation living in hostility, rejection, and rebellion. That's what he means when he says world. It's this planet and this group of humanity, people saying, no, thank you. We don't want you. Why? Our human condition, David says, I was born in iniquity, conceived in sin. To which we say, wait a minute, I haven't made any bad choices yet. Aren't sin, like we said before, isn't it just a series of bad choices? Gary Burge, a theologian, says this, sin is not a series of bad choices, but a state of being from which bad choices continually come over and over. It's Paul in Romans saying, I don't know why I keep doing the things I don't want to do. Have you ever felt that in your own life with the sins that you struggle with? Why do I keep doing this? And he says this kind of crazy little paradox, the things I really want to do, nope. The things I hate doing, I do them all the time. Why? Because it's a state of being. The human condition, he came to the world rebellious, hostile, reject you, Jesus. We don't want you. And that's how we are. Without Christ, that is how we are. But, and if you ever study uh, screenplays, or if you just watch movies, and then everybody that watches movies in here, there's a moment in every movie that's pretty predictable. Towards the end, our hero and characters have kind of been making some progress towards their big moment. And it looks like everything's going to go great. And then it has this one moment and it's called the all hope is lost moment. Next time you watch a movie, see if you can find it. It's that point where you're like, oh no, so-and-so found out and blah, 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 there's the bad guy. And you know, here's our hero on the ground and he's dying and oh, the movie's going to end right here. And then dun, da, 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 like you have this moment where the hero breaks in and that is what John is saying. It is all hope is lost. We've rejected Christ. We've said, no, I don't want you. But, beautiful word in the Bible, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become slaves, very fearful servants who are afraid not to mess up. Nope. What's the word? Children. Family. That's what God once. That miraculous and supernatural transformation that happens because of Jesus, not because of you. A new birth, a supernatural birth that can't be explained except through Christ and his initiating work. My summary of this segment, we were toast, but God. Okay, that's my commentary. We were, like Chad's commentary of this little section, we were toast, but God. Jesus comes through. And then verse 14, the word became flesh, dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Before I keep going, uh, you'll notice in your notes, we have a new thing. Look out memory verses. You don't have to do these, obviously, but I encourage you to. Because what goes in here, when you are squeezed with circumstances, will come out. And sometimes, and we all probably been there too, and we're like, you know, classic hit your hammer with the thumb. It's probably not John 3, 16 coming out, you know? <laughs> We've all been there. But when you are, when life puts you in the vice, when you go through the worst circumstances ever, if this is hidden, if this is hidden, it will come out. And I haven't learned that many verses you know, it's not a requirement to be a pastor to like learn a certain number of verses. I learned more when I was a kid, especially in VBS, because if you learn the verse, you got candy. <laughs> um, but I do remember one, Psalm 1. Remember my youth pastor said, let's learn this together. I was like, okay. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked stand in the path of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. And if he does, he'll be like a tree planted by streams of living water 
that even when it's a difficult time, he'll still bear fruit. But the wicked are not so. They're like the chaff that the wind blows away. I didn't learn that many. I learned that one. And can I tell you how many times in life I've been awakened in the middle of the night, I've been in a difficult circumstance, and what comes spilling out? Psalm 1. <laughs> like over and over, put your hope in me, Chad. Meditate on what I've done. And so that first verse, the word became flesh, dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Learn it. Put it on an index card. This is my little trick. Write it on an index card, fold it up four times, whatever. Stick it in your pocket, in your purse, on your dashboard. Read it. Put it back in your pocket. Work, work, work. Student, student, student. Netflix, Netflix, whatever. Xbox. Pull it out. Read it again. 10, 15 times a day, you'll be surprised how quick. And God will start to make it a part of your soul. And as the index card becomes tattered and soft and broken and creased, so will your heart for God's word. So, a little sidebar. Um, verse 15. John bore witness about him, cried out, this is the one, this is the guy. He's the one I've been telling you about. He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who has at the Father's side. He has made him known. God has made him known how through Jesus, and as I read this and thought about Jesus becoming flesh, becoming a human being, this was the thought that came to my mind. Jesus had a hometown. He had a hometown. You could, if you lived during that time, you could walk up down some street, take a corner, take a turn here, up to some house, and go, Is Jesus home? Imagine, because we, I've had this, I used to do this, and we have friends of our kiddos who come over. And it's that classic kid coming over. What's, hey, um, is, are they home? I mean, can I come in? Is that cool? Like, and we love it. That's, that's what we want our house to be. That's what I want other houses, you know, our kids. Like, it's that thing of just, he was a real person where somebody would come over and stay for dinner. And I think about that. You're sitting at the table. Some kids played with Jesus. That was their play friend growing up. Hung out with him, watched him, you know, sat next to him. Mayor, what's your mom making today, Jesus? I don't know. Hummus. Or whatever, something, you know. <laughs> but he knew he was a real person. God became flesh. Tim Keller said a phrase this week that I just thought was the best way to describe this. To become flesh meant God became killable. Whoa, that brought it home for me. Vulnerable enough to be killed for you. Put on skin so that you would know him. So that you would be able to understand that he understands what you're going through. He understands every hurt and when he says, we have seen his glory, I don't know about you, but whenever I hear that word in the Bible, like, you know, it's not a thing that you use at work. Man, you, I really see the glory in you today. Like nobody says that. It's a Bible word. And so as a Bible word, I've always thought that it meant, like there are certain Bible words and Bible verses that have music behind them. Do you know what I mean? Ah. Like, so that's always been one of those. We've seen his glory, ah. like beams of light. But you know what it means? I was shocked when I read this. And the clue is later on, Jesus said, now the son of man must be glorified. Where was he going? The cross. That's glory? That's God's glory on display? Yep. Kind of hidden, kind of unassuming, kind of like John the Baptist, <clears throat> unseen by pretty much everybody that was there. Even the disciples, it took them some time to get it. That is seeing his glory. And it says he tabernacled among us. That's what dwelt. That's the word. There's not a good English word. 
Because the word in, in the Greek is tabernacled, which is a direct reference to the Old Testament. I know some people have heard this before. You guys don't even care about the Old Testament. You don't believe any of it. Baloney. It's a Greek word for you today. <laughs> he tabernacled, and it is a direct throwback to Moses. And he talks about Moses right here. Because Moses asked God, can I see you? And God said, you'll die. Why? Remember that human condition thing we just talked about? The state of being, our sin? You can't come close. But God said, but here's what I'll do. Build this thing called a tabernacle, put up another special room inside of it, and I will dwell behind that curtain. And a couple of people, you know, can make their way in there. You can come close, get near, but you can't be face to face with me or you'll die. In Jesus, this is what John is telling us. The gap is closed. The veil is torn. And Jesus says, come all the way up here. Face to face with me. Yes, something was between us, but now I'm here. <coughs> dwelling in your midst. No one can speak truth, embody truth, give out grace and love, mercy and kindness like Jesus. A couple of weeks ago when we talked about difficult topics, one of the things I encouraged everybody is, don't talk to me, talk to Jesus. Listen to his voice. If there's anybody that can bring you through difficult things, he can. And even talking to you about difficult truths. I'll close with this. Scott Saul's one of my, there's several guys I listen to every time I do any study. Uh, he's one of my favorites. And he said this about the word of God. And I want you to immediately think Jesus when you hear word, because that's what John was trying to do. And the word of God, he said this, while our feelings will lie to us, God's word never will. <clears throat> Scriptures and God's word through Jesus never will. And we are definitely talking a lot about our feelings. I just don't feel like that's true. That just couldn't be. That's not acceptable. Scripture will never lie to you. God's word will never lie to you. Our feelings will. Jesus, in becoming human, pouring out himself, glorifying himself, came close so that you would be able to come close and not stay far away. And his word, when it is spoken, and I'll just finish with this, accomplishes what it sets out to do. And I'm just going to tell you, if he's after you, look out. He's going to get you. He's going to get you. Our job is to respond to him. And so let's do that. Let's pray. I thank you for John. I, man, I love that he sat across the table from you, walked next to you on the street, heard your voice knew what your mannerisms were like, laughed at your jokes. And for those of us who think somehow Jesus wasn't funny, we forget that he's the one that created humor. But Lord, thank you that we can come close. And God, I just ask that as we study this book and as those of us in this room dare to open it, that you would change us. You would pursue our hearts, God, and we would freely give up our sin that you've paid for. Sit close to you, Lord, and hear your voice and realize, Lord, that it's, it's both that you are the creator of all things and have been here and always have been and that you had a hometown. <laughs> That's wild, but that is the beauty of the gospel. So Lord, meet us now as we worship. In Christ's name, amen.